Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and in this video I wanted to discuss this somewhat fascinating topic of extraterrestrial rain, but not necessarily water rain, any kind of rain, rain of all sorts. And more specifically, we're going to be focusing on this paper that came out really recently that tried to identify what sort of raindrops would be forming and what sort of raindrops we can expect on various objects somewhere out there outside of planet Earth. Something that honestly fascinates me quite a lot. So for example, if we look at this procedurally generated world, we see that there is some liquid here. And because we see this liquid, we can kind of assume that there is probably some sort of a liquid cycle. Now we don't really know what this liquid is, but something has to replenish it once in a while. If we look at the nearby world here, this beautiful gas giant you see in the distance, it also seems to have some sort of a cycle, but we don't really get to see this. But today we know that a lot of these gas giants also have their own liquid cycles on the inside and they have their own types of rain. For example, not so long ago, some of the NASA scientists released this paper analyzing the marsh bowls or these really large hay-like formations made out of ammonia and water mixture that very likely form on Jupiter and possibly even Saturn, but eventually evaporate as they fall closer and closer to the center of the planet. Something that very likely happens in the upper regions of Jupiter and Saturn and something that also then mixes a lot of the materials in these upper atmospheres. But then some other studies also analyzed planets like Neptune and they discovered that in these planets we can expect something similar to a carbon or actually diamond rain. So the pressures and the actual materials on the inside will start forming a kind of a diamond-like cycle where a lot of these miniature diamonds will form drop-like formations and will slowly fall toward the center of the planet. And this is something that a lot of scientists today actually think happens on pretty much most gas giants including Jupiter and Saturn. Meaning that objects like Jupiter might actually have several types of rain in their atmospheres. But naturally this is not something we can see of course, this is only something we can kind of mathematically predict. Kind of similarly to how the scientists today, based on the observations from Venus, can predict that it probably has sulfuric acid rain. And some scientists also suggest that there might be some other more extreme types of rain closer to the surface, specifically rain that might be even difficult to imagine. In this case I'm referring to supercritical carbon dioxide rain. But that's actually very speculative, mostly because the surface of Venus is still very difficult for us to see. And then of course there are several exoplanets discovered so far that might possess anything from metal rain or iron rain to titanium rain to even just rocky rain. So depending on the conditions here, a lot of different planets can actually have very different cycles functioning in a very similar way to how a water cycle functions on planet Earth. With one of the more interesting discoveries in the last few years, and one of the most well-studied planets being this one right here known as HD 819733b, that a few years ago the scientists analyzed and discovered that it very likely has glass rain. With an extremely rapid atmosphere with a lot of different activity on the surface, including of course this very unusual glass liquid cycle. Back then NASA even made this kind of a funky poster that you can actually download and print for yourself sort of promoting this planet as if it's an object we can one day visit. Although well, personally, I don't think that would be a place I would want to visit anytime soon. And so with so many different types of rain on so many different planets, including the ones in the solar system, the scientists are of course kind of curious to see how these types of rains differ from one another or if there's some sort of a commonality to all of them. With one specific question that actually needed to be answered, being the shape and the size of the actual drops. Are these drops going to be different in size? If so, how are they different? And are they going to be different in shape? And if so, how? So in other words, let's just say we imagine ourselves on that glass rain world. Is the glass rain going to be very similar to the type of rain we get here on planet Earth in terms of shape, size and the general velocity of raindrops? Or are they going to be these really huge chunks or possibly really really tiny pieces completely difficult for us to imagine? Or more realistically, let's just say we wanted to find ourselves on the surface of Titan, which hopefully one day we will. It just so happens that Titan is the only other object out there where we are absolutely certain there is a cycle, there is a liquid cycle. This is the object that does contain lakes, it's an object that does have rain and it's an object that has an active atmosphere. So even though for gas giants like Neptune, Saturn and so on, we're kind of speculating there's rain, for Titan we're absolutely certain there's rain. And for Titan, 
Just like for those other objects, the rain here is not water. In this case, it's methane. And so if the rain is made out of methane, we will actually produce different types of raindrops. Is the shape going to be different because the molecules are different? Is the speed going to be different? Are they going to be dramatically different in size? And well, basically a lot of other questions in regards to what happens to these raindrops as it rains on Titan. And so the scientists behind the paper you can find in the description decided to try to answer these questions aiming at the objects here in the solar system. So objects like Titan, objects like Jupiter and Saturn, and also objects like Mars with hypothetical rain that might one day happen there as well and possibly did happen in the past. And while the major discovery coming out of this paper is that rain for the most part seems to be more or less the same no matter where you go, no matter what it's made out of, and no matter how big or small the planet is. In other words, this is some sort of a universal experience for all objects in the universe, at least the ones that have any kind of a liquid cycle. But obviously all of these cycles will also depend on the clouds. Now clouds generally are extremely difficult to model or to try to study. We don't really even understand them on Earth very well just yet. But turns out trying to model rain is actually not as difficult. And so by starting with the raindrops, we can then sort of try to extrapolate this to the more general idea of the cycle on a certain planet. In other words, this is actually a really important step in order to understand how various liquid cycles might work on other planets or other moons like Titan. But first of all, for the cycle to function correctly, such as for example the cycle on Titan, the raindrop obviously has to make it to the surface. And so obviously if the raindrop is too big in size, it's not going to survive the trip to the surface and it's most likely going to fall apart into smaller raindrops. But if the size is too small, it's going to disappear because it's going to evaporate on the way to the surface. Kind of like what we believe happens on the gas giants. So here the raindrops evaporate and bring some of the materials closer to the center of the planet. But because Titan has liquid on the surface, it means that the raindrops here have to be very specific in terms of size and shape. And so there has to be some sort of, um, as the scientists refer to it, Goldilocks zone for basically the shape and also the size of raindrops. Now let's start with the shape. So apparently as the raindrops fall, at first they start as spheres, but as they get closer and closer to the surface, they acquire this shape that sort of resembles a burger bun. And it seems that this shape is universal no matter where you go, no matter what the actual drop is made out of. So if we go to Titan, we'll find methane that is shaped the same. If we go to some distant planet somewhere far far away, we'll probably find something similar in shape. And although smaller raindrops do actually have a spherical shape, as they grow in size they become these miniature buns. With the average maximum size on planet Earth being roughly around 11 millimeters. But what about Titan? Well the shape is still going to be the same, but because the gravity here is much lower, the size of the drop is going to be 2 to 3 times larger. Now that's actually kind of surprising because in terms of the total mass, Earth is way way more massive than Titan. This is about 2% the mass of planet Earth. And so the gravity here is also much much weaker. On Titan the gravity is about 8 times weaker than planet Earth. While at the same time the surface pressure on the surface is higher than planet Earth. So I personally thought that maybe the drops here would be way way bigger in size. But turns out that that's not really correct. The size is only a little bit bigger. As a matter of fact, these were the biggest raindrops that they were able to simulate. Once again, here's the one from planet Earth for comparison. And by the way, this is actually really zoomed in. So in reality, it's only about this big. It's only about like one inch in size. Then if we look at objects like Jupiter and Saturn, we'll find that Saturn has really similar in size and in shape um, raindrops as planet Earth, with Jupiter having slightly smaller ones, mostly because of the higher gravity and obviously much higher pressures near the center as well. And lastly, hypothetically for planet Mars, if it were to have rain on the surface or if it had rain in the past, the raindrops were slightly larger than the ones we have on planet Earth. And so here is how all of this looks like if we were to compare it to planet Earth. Now this is a little bit surprising for, I guess, several reasons. The first reason, of course, being the fact that you would expect these raindrops to differ dramatically based on the element, of course, and also based on the gravity, based on the atmospheric pressure and so on. But in reality, what the scientists think is happening here is that the main property of the raindrops that determines their size and, of course, determines their shape is the surface tension of the uh, material. Surface tension, of course, being that fundamental property of all liquids 
that allows them to shrink into the smallest possible surface area and to kind of stay in that particular shape until more liquid is introduced. Here's a really awesome video showing you how the surface tension of this water droplet is actually going to affect the droplet as it splits in two. Notice how it instantly assumes a spherical shape. And the surface tension for water is really, really high. It's a lot higher than the surface tension for methane. Because of this, the droplet for methane can actually expand to larger size. But surprisingly here, the material itself does not really influence the size that dramatically. Even though the surface tension of water is about 14 times higher than methane, as you can see, the size difference for all of these droplets is really not that dramatic at all. And so the conclusion from the study is that, well, it's not entirely clear why such an unusual uniformity exists for all droplets of all materials. No matter what the rain droplet is made out of, whether it be some sort of liquid iron, glass, methane, or of course water, it seems to possess similar shapes, it seems to also possess similar size, at least to some extent, and it obviously also seems to possess other properties like, for example, evaporation and, of course, formation of liquid bodies on the surface. Which of course also means that our imagining of, let's just say, some sort of a lava world where there is a lava rain with some really, really unusual extreme weather conditions on the surface would not really be far off if we imagined it as very typical rain on Earth. Or basically, lava rain here would not really be that different. At least not different in terms of shape and what it does to the surface. And it seems that now we can actually even predict some of these properties. For example, the speed of the rain, how fast it falls toward the surface, mostly depends on the surface pressure and the gravity of the object. So if we go back to Titan here, here the raindrops very likely fall really, really slowly toward the surface because the gravity is much lower, but also because the pressure is much higher. Then the other question of whether the raindrops make it to the surface and create some sort of liquid or not can be determined by studying the atmosphere and specifically by studying atmospheric conditions, pressure, temperature, humidity, and so on, and determining whether the raindrops evaporate in the atmosphere or whether they make it to the surface. And so overall, this study is actually pretty brilliant in presenting us with this relatively thorough analysis on how we can potentially predict what happens on other objects. So now, by using these techniques, hypothetically, the scientists could predict if a certain planet does indeed have some sort of a lava ocean, glass ocean, or maybe even diamond ocean, or possibly even predict some of the other atmospheric effects that all of this rain might form. But for now, it's still kind of difficult to predict and to analyze some of these objects, mostly because we still need to have better telescopes. And for objects like Titan, well, we actually have to have a mission here to land and to try to investigate what happens to all of these liquids by looking at them directly. And one such mission is going to be launching in approximately six years from now, with the estimate of arrival being 2034. Now, this mission is going to be super exciting because it's also going to be a kind of a helicopter, but I guess it will still have a long time to wait before this actually happens. And so what sort of a surface Titan has, what sort of rain it has, and what kind of liquids it has on the surface is not really going to be a question we're going to be answering anytime soon, but it is a question we're going to be answering at some point in the future. But anyway, until then, well, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. The main idea behind the study is that rain seems to be universal, and rain seems to be, for the most part, similar no matter what it's made out of, no matter where you go. And that's a pretty cool discovery. But until we learn more, or until we discover some other really cool rain, such as chocolate rain, well, I guess that's all I wanted to mention in this video. On that note, thank you so much for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Either way, I'll see you tomorrow, stay wonderful, and as always, bye-bye.